this lesson, we're going to look at predicting the different ways that elements can combine to form compounds. When different atoms want to hook together to form a compound, they form a bond. A bond is a stable electron configuration. From the point of view of an atom, they will see a full valence ring around themselves in whichever react direction they may look. There are two ways to achieve this stable configuration. Atoms might share electrons. This is called a covalent bond. There may also be a give and take of electrons. This is called an ionic bond. Whether or not atoms will choose to share electrons or give and take electrons depends on their electronegativity. Electronegativity is the way that atoms measure how strong they are, not only at holding on to their own electrons, but also how strong they are at attracting electrons away from other elements. Electronegativity, then, is a measure of how strongly an atom attracts electrons. Metallic bonding, ionic bonding, and covalent bonding are the three main ways that atoms attach to each other. Metallic bonding isn't true bonding, and I'll cover it in a minute. Bonding itself is usually considered to be ionic or covalent. You may remember from grade 10 that ionic bonding occurs between metals and nonmetals. The reason for this is there is a great difference in the strength of their electronegativities. Nonmetals are typically very strong and can actually rip electrons off of metals. In doing so, they form negatively charged anions. Nonmetals tend to lose their electrons because they have very weak electronegativities and therefore they form cations. The positive cations and the negative anions are electrostatically attracted to each other and they will stick together. In covalent bonding, you might remember from grade 10 that this typically happens between two nonmetals. Both of the nonmetals have similar strengths, similar electronegativities, and neither can actually pull the electrons off of the other atom. So their over outer shells, their valence shells, will overlap and their electrons will share. Covalent bonded compounds are often called molecules. There is bonding of a type that happens with metals as well. With metals, because their valence electrons are so weakly held, the electrons tend to swim freely amongst all this remaining central cation portions. In this example that we see in the bottom of the diagram, we have free electrons swimming freely in and around the remaining cation portion or central portion made up of the nucleus and the inner shell electrons. That negative charge acts almost like a negative jelly that allows the remainder of the atoms to stick together. This is the way that metals form bonds. I'm going to use the word bonds loosely here. Because those electrons are free to swim around in between all of the different atoms, metals become good conductors of electricity. Electricity is just the flow of electrons. In this course, we're just going to be looking at ionic and covalent bonds. Remember, we said that ionic bonds occur between metals and nonmetals. When we look at the strengths of the electronegativities of a metal and a nonmetal, we'll notice that the difference in their strength is greater than 1.67. 1.67 is that magic number. It's that minimum difference in strength required for someone to win the tug of war of the electrons. Each atom is pulling on the electrons, trying to hold on to its valence shell electrons and also attract away electrons of the other one. The difference in the strength of these poles must be at least 1.67 in order for the electron to go towards one of the atoms and form an anion. Covalent bonds happen when we have two nonmetals. This is because their electronegativity difference is less than 1.67. So they end up having a sharing of electrons. Now, not all sharing is equal. 
When the sharing is unequal, when the electron is closer to one atom than the other, we call that covalent. When the sharing of the electrons is equal, and the electron is essentially in the middle of the two atoms, we call this nonpolar covalent. We know that a covalently bonded molecule will be polar if the difference in their electronegativities ends up being between 0 0.5 and 1.67. If the difference is less than 0.5, it is nonpolar. Consider, for example, a molecule made with sodium and fluorine. On the periodic tables I gave you with this course, or you can look up an example of a chart of electronegativities. You will see that the electronegativity on chlorine is 3.00. The electronegativity on a sodium atom is only 0 0.84. When we subtract the difference, we get a value, a difference in the electronegativity. You'll often see it written as a change in the electronegativity in this version of 2.16. 2.16 would hit about here on a number line. It's past that minimum value of 1.67, and so the bonding in sodium chloride is ionic. When we subtract, we always subtract the bigger value minus the smaller value. Compare them to where they would land on a number line to determine if they are ionic, polar covalent, or non-polar covalent. We can practice a few examples together. Suppose I'm curious of the type of bond that would form between calcium and oxygen. Calcium is on the left-hand side of the zigzag line and is a metal. Oxygen on the right is a non-metal. Because we have a situation with a metal and a non-metal, we would guess that this would form an ionic bond. To test this hypothesis, we can check by looking at the difference in the electronegativities. Oxygen's electronegativity is 3.5. Calcium's electronegativity is 1.0. When you subtract we get a difference of 2.5. 2.5 is greater than 1.67, so our actual bond type will end up being ionic. In this case, our prediction and our test are equal. It's not always the case. In the case of potassium and sulfur, we see that potassium is a metal and sulfur is a nonmetal, so our prediction is ionic. Checking the electronegativities. Sulfur's electronegativity is 2.5 and potassium's is 0 0.8. The difference is 1.7. We know that any number 1.67 and more as a difference in electronegativity tends to be ionic. You will find some textbooks having this cutoff point anywhere between 1.6 and 1.9. There seems to be some discrepancy about where the difference must lie. So although it is ionic according to our definition, it is close. On my assessments, I tend to avoid giving you any value where the value will be close and forcing you to make a judgment call. I don't see that as being a fair test of you understanding the concept. However, if you do see examples where you go, hmm, this lands right on the line, which way should I go? If it is a metal and a non-metal, tend towards calling it ionic. If it becomes between two non-metals, tend towards calling it covalent. To help you practice predicting and checking whether compounds will be ionic or covalent, and if they are covalent, will they be polar or nonpolar, I'll have you work on the page 16 of your green workbooklets. In our next lesson, we will look at how we can do names and formulas for compounds based on whether they are ionic or covalent. The rules that we use to figure out names and formulas are different for each, so we must first get good at deciding what kind of bonding will occur.